I'm now delighted uh, to introduce Erin. And uh, you have 15 minutes, starting from now. Thank you. <laughs> so thanks. I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and I'll try to be as destructive as I can. Um, my uh, group and I at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel uh, studies uh, host microbiome interactions and their impact on uh, metabolic health and cardiometabolic disease, uh, which, as you've heard from uh, Jeff Gordon, is increasingly recognized to be critically important in orchestration uh, of these sets of disease. Um, and what we find especially interesting and fascinating is the fact that uh, these interactions are influenced by many environmental and host intrinsic factors. And we see it as our mission in life to try and decipher the mo molecular and mechanistic basis of these interactions one after the other. Um, and when I say we, I refer to my own group and my good friend and colleague, uh, Aran Siegel, also from the Weizmann Institute. He's a mathematician who collaborates with us on many of our studies. Um, and given the context of, of, this, uh, um, of this meeting, um, I'll show you some of our um, major insights on how diet interacts with the microbiome and potentially impacts uh, metabolic health and uh, disease. And when we started looking into this, um, we first read um, all the, in the, the previous literature, which uh, forms the basis of what all of us here in the room um, are doing intuitively when we uh, try to you know, come up with a diet that is so-called healthy for ourselves. And, and what I was really surprised to find was that, that everything that we do, even without thinking about it, is based in one way or another on one of several scoring systems that basically give numbers or give grades to different foods. For example, calories are one such system that gives different grades to different foods. And based on these grades, we try to combine different ingredients in, in coming up with, with a good diet. When dealing with um, normalization of blood sugar and obesity through normalization of blood sugar, the most widely used grading system is called the glycemic index. And um, uh, just to remind those of you who don't remember what the glycemic index is, it is based on very small scale studies um, performed in the 1970s in which small groups of human volunteers, usually 10 people per group, were given an identical food and then their blood sugar levels were measured uh, for two hours after they ate this food. So for example, if you would take a group of 10 human volunteers, give them an identical piece of celery, measure their blood sugar levels for two hours, you would probably get an average spike in blood sugar levels just like the black spike here. And this average rise would be given a number, and this is the glycemic index of celery. Now, if you would now take the same group of volunteers and give them an identical piece of chocolate cake, their average rise in blood sugar levels would be the blue graph on higher uh, level, and this higher number would be the glycemic index of chocolate cake. Now, if you look in your smartphones, you will find endless tables that give a glycemic index to any food on Earth or any food components on Earth. And you need to take my word for it that many, if not most, of the diets that you've ever tried, uh, using a, a consultation by your dietitian, by your family physician, or a book at the airport, are based in one way or another on this glycemic index. Now, here comes the big, big problem. When we repeated these experiments, not with 10 human volunteers, but with 1,000 human volunteers, we got the following surprising results. So on the left, you can see a panel describing 1,000 volunteers to which we gave an identical piece of food, one of several foods. And we measured uh, the blood sugar levels. Now, the average response of these individuals to any food was exactly the glycemic index of that food. So it's actually correct and accurate. However, when we looked at the individualized level, the variability in people's response when given the same exact food was unbelievably high. So some people, for example, that got uh, 50 grams of glucose spiked to diabetic levels, while others didn't spike at all. And this was true for, the, uh, uh, for any test food that we've provided these people. This was all, also true for hundreds of different foods in real life situations, which we've measured in these 1,000 individuals on the right. So the variability was incredibly high, and this already questions the paradigm of a one-size-fits-all diet, which we all are chasing for many years. Um, and, and our argument is that it is probably not existent because if your response to a given food is opposite than mine, then the same diet cannot be good for you and for me. And this was the, the premise for a very ambitious large-scale project, which we termed the Personalized Nutrition Project, in which we took these 1,000 individuals and we kindly asked them to give us a week of their life. And during this week, we collected an unprecedented amount of person-specific big data. 
And this included, for example, a very deep uh, characterization of the gut microbiome by both 16S uh, uh, ribosomal DNA and shotgun metagenomic analyses, many blood tests that we've taken, many questionnaires that these people filled with respect to their uh, um, food preferences, background medical illnesses, uh, medications, and so on and so forth, anthropometrics. We've uh, developed a smartphone app, especially for this project, which allowed the people during the week of follow-up to tell us everything that they were doing, when they were going to sleep, when they were waking up, when they were going to eat, what they were eating, how much they were eating of whatever they were eating. Um, we connected each of these individuals to a continuous glucose monitor that measures blood sugar levels every five minutes for an entire week. So in comparison to the 1970s, in which the glycemic index was based on six measurements, here each individual was me measured 2,500, 2,500 times during the week of follow-up. And the most important and interesting thing happened after the end of the follow-up period for all of these individuals, where uh, um, a very talented group of computational students at the lab took all of this big data from each of these individuals and used advanced machine learning techniques in order to devise an algorithm for each individual that is aimed to predict his or her glycemic response to any given food, including foods that they haven't even consumed during the week of follow-up. Now, you may ask how we can predict something that we didn't measure. This is exactly what Google, Facebook, and Amazon are doing in your daily lives. So for example, when you buy five books from Amazon, you start getting emails suggesting more books. What, what do they do? They cluster you to people with so-called similar tastes, and they start offering you the books that they have purchased. So this is very simplistic, but this is basically the same machine learning uh, system that we apply to nutrition. And to make a very, very, very long story short, this is the gist of the results. So on the left, you can see uh, what we measure to be the predictability of the gold standard approach today. So it's not completely useless. When we go to our physician or our dietitian and we ask for a diet that would normalize our blood sugar level, we usually are given a diet that is low in carbohydrates, which does have some merit to it. But the predictability uh, uh, to different foods is very poor, and we measured it to be 0 0.38. In contrast, when we used our measurement-based, machine learning-based approach, um, we dramatically increased our ability to predict to 0 0.68 in the middle panel. And in these kind of experiments, you have to, at some point, freeze your trained algorithm and apply it on a new cohort of blinded people in order to avoid issues such as overfitting. So we did this for another cohort of 100 individuals, which were not included in the training of the algorithm. And you can see on the right that the predictability is equally uh, uh, good, almost to the level of uh, the roof uh, uh, based on inter-individual variability. Now, we were very happy with ourselves at this point, but it was also time to put ourselves to the real-life test. So in order to do this, we allocated another cohort this time of pre-diabetic individuals, and I, I don't need to tell this crowd that this is one of the biggest uh, unmet problems that we face. Uh, in the US, around 40% of the adult population are pre-diabetic. Um, as a clinician, I can tell you, you know, we, we, they come to us, we tell them to exercise more, to eat less than they ever do, and they develop a risk of 70 to 80% of developing full-blown type 2 diabetes within the next decade of their life. So we took this group of individuals, we put them through our machine learning process, but this time, we, we kindly asked the algorithm to conceive a group of individualized good diets for each individual and a group of individualized bad diets for the same individual. And we also asked that the good and bad diets per individual would be isocaloric, so we wouldn't blame calories. And then each of these individuals was asked to eat only his or her personalized good diet for a week and then personalized bad diet for another week while we extensively measured them using all of the uh, parameters I've shown you before. So just, just to give you an example of how counterintuitive these measurement-based uh, diets are, if we take one of our participants, one of our pre-diabetic participants, and I would show you two diets that the machine learning algorithm conceived for that individual and would ask you which would be the good diet and which is the bad diet, uh, the, the diet on the left consisting of muesli and sushi, the diet on the right cons consuming, uh, uh, consisting of ademama and, and hummus, um, you would probably give me a 50-50 uh, result, just like the, the toss of a coin, because we, we've done this experiment with our own students, and this was the result we got. In this case, for example, the good diet for that individual is the one that included ice cream. This is actually true for 70% of the population, which didn't spike on ice cream at all, while the bad diet, in this case, included the one consisting of corn and sushi, so it's completely unexpected and uh, uh, something that we would not guess. But when we measure that individual for uh, two weeks, one week with good diet and one week with bad diet, you can see that when that individual ate her bad diet, 
she spiked almost to diabetic level. This is the diet with sushi and with muzzle. When, uh, uh, this is in red. In green, you can see that when she ate the, the ice cream uh, diet, you know, she completely normalized the blood sugar level. If I would show you a different participant and ask you the same question, you would find it equally difficult uh, to guess what is the bad and what is the good diet. In this case, the good diet consists of a croissant and beef, halva, hummus, which is the, the world's best food. Um, <laughs> and uh, the bad diet in this case included the uh, fruits, so, so you would never be able to guess without measuring. And again, when we measure this individual, when they ate, when, when that individual ate his bad individualized diet, he spiked, you see the red spikes. Well, when he ate uh, his uh, good personalized diet in green, he normalized his pre-diabetic levels already within one week of uh, intervention. And just to show you that I'm not showing you my favorite two participants, in all participants, uh, this was statistically uh, significant, this improvement after a single week of intervention uh, uh, of this unexpected personalized measurement-based uh, 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 nutrition. Now, one of the biggest advantage of this unbiased approach is that once you achieve a good training and a good predictability and you measure people, now you can dive back in retrospect into the machine learning algorithm and ask it which feature it used uh, or which features were more important or less important for the predictability. And then you can actually take these features and all of them will be the start of a project in testing them mechanistically in conventional ways. So what we were really happy to see is the group of features that was most prominent in predicting people's responses to food were, were uh, ones that related to the gut microbiome. So there were a whole lot of features, each contributing a little bit, but these are, uh, these are now um, the, the subject of uh, regular mechanistic uh, uh, investigation uh, that would take us a while, but, but it is a very useful way to identify that. <laughs> and so what are we doing now? Uh, we are engaged in multiple follow-up uh, human studies. Uh, for example, one study was just completed in which uh, our partners from the Mayo Clinic copy-pasted this approach to uh, an American population. It's very important because the microbiome is different, the nutrition is different, this population is extremely prone to obesity in its complications, and despite the fact that we had to tweak some features of the, of the algorithms, the results were as impressive and the predictability was as good as noted in our Israeli uh, uh, cohort. The second trial is a double-blind uh, interventional trial, which we call the PNP3, the Personalized Nutrition Project 3, which includes a large cohort of uh, individuals that are, are pre-diabetic and divided into two arms. One, receiving the American Diabetic, Diabetes Association diet, which, as you know, doesn't work that well. And the other uh, uh, arm um, consists of the personalized intervention, this time for a whole year which would hopefully teach us something about the merits of this approach in reversing or ameliorating uh, the longer clinical uh, outcomes uh, related to, to cardiometabolic disease, including fatty liver, obesity, hypertriglyceridemia, and of course, pre-diabetic and, and, and its conversion to diabetes and vice versa. Um, this, this trial is in a very advanced uh, stage with 170 of the 200 uh, uh, planned participants already completed uh, um, their participation. And the third study, which we just started, is one that involves a collaboration with uh, partners from southern Italy, in which for the first time we're trying to apply this system to the pediatric population, which as you know is an emerging unmet issue and problem with respect to obesity and its complication. And uh, collectively we'll see what these different studies uh, teach us uh, going forward. Um, and I'll finish by thanking the many good people in, in my lab uh, who were uh, involved in these very ambitious uh, projects, our collaborators, the funding agencies that are uh, generously funding this work and other works. Um, and I think I'll stop here. Thanks.